a show about compelling interior settings coming up right after this. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. In today's show, I have a few special guests that will share tips on accessorizing a room, how to properly light an area in the home, and how to decorate with these gorgeous votives. Plus, I want to show you a popular interior space here at my farm. As you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show. So let's get started in the front room of the house where we're looking at the window treatments. Having the proper window treatments can make a huge difference in any room, not just with regard to the aesthetics and the decor. My friend Zach Gibbs tells us the benefits of these and how to properly hang them. Zach, I want to show you why I feel like these drapery panels are such a compliment to the, to the windows here in the house. Uh, the design intent here was to create something that was Greek Revival in style. It's all brand new, but made to look like an old style. And the Greek Revival uh, style is, is characterized by these really large moldings, these, these window surrounds and the notched uh, dog ear, if you will, that comes down. Um, to a, a baseboard and to a plinth block is all characteristic. And, and the depth too, if you look back here, you can see that we've got this panelization and this slight angle. In fact, there's about 18 inches of depth here, which indicates sort of the thickness of the walls, which creates some really nice reveal here in the house. Yeah, the way these were pitched on an angle uh, created some challenges for us um, when we were <laughs> configuring. Leave it to me. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, overall it came out great. You know, certainly we didn't want to cover up any of this nice molding and the detail that you've created. Well, I like the, the kick down here that you have or the slight fold where the drapery isn't just flush with the floor. Tell me about that. Uh, we added a slight break on the floor to really give that warmth and fullness to the mm -hmm. drapery, which is certainly relevant and needed in an entryway like this. Um, so the way they're touching the floor, I think, will complement the, uh, the surroundings really well. Well, it certainly has warmed the entry hall up to have, have the drapery here and above uh, the stairwell here and then also in the front room. Absolutely. I think Hesiod here is enjoying it too. He looks a little warmer and happier. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, thanks for all your help. You're welcome. My friend, Lindsay Coral Harper, an interior designer from New York, shares some of her tips on sprucing up a room with a few colorful accessories. <music> Lindsay, I really like the way you've edited down everything on this table, just to three objects. Well, I think it's nice and it's clean, but what's great is you've got the height of a lamp, mm -hmm. you've got something natural from outside with a flower, and then right. you have a really beautiful object. Well, orchids are natural, aren't they? Yeah. They look great in any setting. Now, what about just using house plants and live plants as an accessory? Is that something you do often as a designer? I do. I think it's very easy, it's very natural, and the colors are always really beautiful. As a designer, why are accessories important to you when you're creating a room? Well, I think they add a level of warmth in who you are. They can be a memento, it can be something passed down, but it can also be something as easy as a plant from the outside. So it's anything that you love. And are there any rules about using them, like too many or, or colors or you know, materials and so forth? Right. I don't know that there are any one particular rule. I think you want to keep it simple. You don't want to have too many. Less is more. But you can also, you don't have to have everything that you own out on one side table. You can constantly switch it up. And speaking of switched up, I really like the way you switched up this coffee table. Yeah. The daffodils are amazing. <clears throat> the daffodils are beautiful. One easy rule of thumb with a cocktail table is you can really start with a stack of books. Yes, I can see how books can be great platforms for other objects. It's really easy. You can put any a box on top of that, an object, again, flowers. It's a great starting point. And then just mix up a few objects, I guess, just for visual interest. Exactly. You don't need a lot. It can be anything that you like, anything colorful. 
Other flat surfaces in the home would include like a mantle, and I like what you've done here in this room with the, with the mantle. Yeah, thank you. I think mantles are great, especially if you have a nice large mirror, and it's really easy to stack artwork on top of that. And, and the daffodils, you've got that color echo going back and forth across the room. Yeah, it's just really nice and unexpected and it looks great. So is there a rule of thumb that you always think about or fall back on when you're accessorizing your room? I think the easiest thing is just to kind of play with what you have, keep it simple, and edit. Very good. Well, I love what you've done here today. We have wonderful things to play with. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know about you, but I often don't think about just how important lighting can be in the rooms of our homes. But having the proper lighting in certain areas can make all the difference in the world. My friend Christopher Spitzmiller, who's a lamp designer from New York City, shares some of his tips on properly illuminating a room. So Chris, when using a standing lamp like this, what, what kinds of things should someone keep in mind? I like not showing any of the hardware in the lamp so that the light bulbs don't come down and none of the hardware is showing. You know, when we designed this house, I really wanted large windows where it would flood the rooms with, with sunlight. And when placing lights in this room, I, I wanted to feel as natural as possible. Well, you've done that. You've got two by the window, two here by the fireplace, and the two hanging lights. There's no overhead lighting, which is gonna be the best possible solution for this room. So are there any rules of thumb to follow when, when placing lamps in a room? When considering where you put your lamps, you wanna consider where you're reading or anything that you wanna draw attention to in the room. So it's really what you're gonna accent or how you're gonna use the room. Exactly. Yeah, and, and when it comes to um, the color of the light itself, what, what, how do you feel about that? I prefer a warm light bulb myself. Yeah, I do too, because it feels more natural. It feels like sunlight. It is. It's much more natural. Yeah. And, and the color of, of the lamp, I mean, you, I mean, in your studio, you offer like 50 different colors. We do. We offer a lot of different <laughs> colors, and we do custom colors as well on top of it. But what I say to people, if they're ever unsure of it, pick a white lamp, because a white lamp will go in most any room you have. Well, I, you know, I, I love white in this house because it lightens and it's a great color for summer and for spring. But I also love uh, orange, something that really makes the room pop with a lamp for like fall and winter. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to shades, what, what kind of shade do you like to see on your, your lamps, the ones that you design? I like to see a translucent shade that the light can flow out and come around in the room from. That's what I like to see the best. And so a translucent shade could be made of, um, I guess, vellum or paper? Yeah, ours are made of paper, vellum, but they could be made out of cloth, linen, silk, any of those materials are good. Well, Chris, thanks for coming out. I appreciate all the great advice and some of the tips you've given are the sort of thing that anyone can use in their home. Thank you for having me, Alan. I've appreciated it. You caught me. I'm just a big kid at heart. You know, outfitting a children's room can be challenging. It's not as easy as you think. When I design children's room, there are three things that I like to keep in mind. One is durability. Second, it's got to have the right mood or feel. And third, it needs to be adaptable to change because after all, they're gonna be growing up. So let me show you what I did in this kid's room. One of the first things I wanted to do was to make sure that the beds in here were, well, solid and that they were covered in something really durable. So you know what? I had the headboards made with an indoor-outdoor fabric. Not only are the headboards and footboards done that way, but also the coverlets or the bedspreads. This stuff is really easy to clean. It's ironclad and indestructible. For the other pieces of furniture, I went with something equally durable, metal nested tables that are painted a bright color. And if you take a look at the floor, I painted the floors a bright color with a very durable floor paint, and this is a cotton rug over it, easy to wash, easy to care for. Now let's talk about the mood of the room. Who wants a dull, somber room? I used bright colors. 
The walls are painted a pale blue. Again, the floor is green. All the trim is white. And the fabrics I've used, well, they're really perky. I used pink on these beds, and the two beds over here I used blue. Girls, boys. And to make it simple, all the colors that I chose for this room really sprang from this one piece of fabric that I'm using as a dust ruffle. It's whimsical and fun, and if you just use this as a guide, you can't go wrong in terms of creating a sense of harmony in the space. Also, the other things I added to make this room fun, I used some of their own artwork and framed it. They love that. And also, lots of books up here on subjects they love. Who doesn't love a puppy? Now, the major components in this room are easily adaptable to change. The major components are, well, the four single beds here. You see, not only did I have these upholstered headboards and footboards done, they're slip covered. So if I want to change the colorway in this room, then it'll be easily done as the kids mature. And then, of course, the artwork can change as well. As they grow up, we can shift these things out that they did in grade school, and they can hang up their Justin Bieber posters if they like. Thanks for joining me as we explore some amazing locales here in the Windy City. Even though Chicago is the third largest city in the country, there are some amazing outdoor spaces and indoor spaces to explore. Take this place for instance, two and a half acres under glass. Now that's not a series of containers of plants, this is a planted landscape. To learn more about it, why don't we catch up with my friend Mary. This is such an astonishing place. Well, this is the gem of the conservatory, really. This I believe is the, it. This room is the most intact room from its start in 1908. These plants uh, were here long before any flowering plants were on the planet. Right, so these are right. some of the earliest plants on Earth. So many of these plants literally go back to the Jurassic period, which would be 200 million plus years. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, for instance, right here we have a cycad. Wow, look at that one. Isn't that amazing? It's a now, huge specimen. The, these plants are over 300 years oh, old, my just gosh. this plant. That's what's so cool about this room. Look at these ferns over here. Gosh, they're just everywhere. Yeah, we have about 150 different kinds of species of ferns. Really? I mean, that's just ferns alone. So. I love the way Jensen designed this and that you're walking down these hallways of ancient plants. He, he stratified these rocks so that it would look like ancient Illinois. This is what basically the geology uh, from around here is. So this is really what uh, Illinois would have looked like 200 million years ago. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly that's right. I noticed that you have this sculpture here in the pond, which is marvelous. These are very ethereal and amorphous. Yeah, we have art exhibits here as part of the work that we do. How nice. We uh, ask that the artists uh, somehow relate to the plants. So you can see that there's some leaf shapes within this uh, sculpture. Right. So it's a way for us to drive attendance, yeah. but more importantly, I it's I love a, that combination of art and nature. Yeah, because yeah. it helps people understand the nature a little bit better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Yeah. It's just marvelous. sleeping porch. Everyone loves the sleeping porch when they come to visit. You know what's so wonderful about it is that you feel like you're going away to summer camp. There's just something about it that makes people feel nostalgic. When I'm entertaining guests and I think they may want to stay out here, I try to add a few creature comforts. Some water, magazines, and I love these quilts. They're not old, but they work with the, the style and color of the beds. You see these quilts pick up the colors of blue, chartreuse, pink, salmon, the colors that I have out here in the room. Now what's so wonderful about this is you can wake up to fresh air. You don't have to worry about the insects because of this screen wire. I'll give you a little tip. If you do a screened in porch, 
and you want to be able to look through the wire mesh. What I used here is a copper wire rather than aluminum because it's easier to see through. Whereas with the aluminum I found, it shimmers and is very apparent as you try to look through it. Now the history of the sleeping porch, well, it's not surprising. I mean, it really was popular before there was air conditioning. So in the late 19th century, early 20th century, sleeping porches in certain parts of the country, particularly the South, were all the rage. Now one of the things that I like about this room is it really is fitted out like a room in your home. I have lamps and tables and of course the beds. And then there are the house plants. This is the perfect place to bring them out for their summer camp. Now I keep emphasizing summer. Actually, sleeping porches can be used any time of the year as long as the weather is mild. I use the sleeping porch 12 months out of the year. It's a great place to just kick back and relax. excited about the stairs going in come over here and look you can see the stringer here the stairs start over there on that side in this house what we're doing is we're taking every possible inch and converting it into usable space of some form well wouldn't you know it we got a snow and the ground is really slick and wet because we got a lot of rain before the snow and they brought some lumber and the guy got stuck so it's a good thing that we have a tractor here and Tony's worked it out where we've gotten him on his way and he just delivered this uh, new pallet of lumber for going up with the roof of the house. Hey, we've established the highest point on the house. All right, so the decking just got delivered. We're not just using OSB, we're using one that has a reflective coating on the outside, which will help reflect some of the heat uh, that's gonna be pounding this roof over the years to come. You know, the goal with this project is to get as much livable space as we can out of the entire footprint of the house. So we got a 1,650 square foot house. And in order to maximize all the space, we had to use the upstairs, which is the attic space. Hey, the skeleton of the house is about to get its first layer of skin. We're actually gonna take this wrap and take it all around the house. And it's made of plastic, but if you look closely, you can see that it's perforated. The idea here is that it will allow oxygen, air, to exchange from the inside outside. You, you want a house to breathe. So, but what this also does is it protects this outer sheathing from moisture. Hey, if you don't want your windows to sag, you better make sure you got headers. You know, I don't care what anybody says, you can have blueprints all day long, but at the end of the day, you gotta get up in the space and you gotta get a sense of how it feels. Who doesn't love a fireplace? Toasty, warm in the winter? You're coming in through this entry hall, 10 foot ceilings into this room, and down at this end is gonna be a focal point. So here on this wall, which faces south, we have arranged from the very beginning a firebox. I've just taken a little tour here and all of the rooms are now clearly defined. And they're clearly defined by these two befores which are made of fur. I love a house that has a series of experiences. So what you have in this case, you're gonna come on to this new porch that's coming along into an entry hall and into what would be the family or great room. So there is a sequence of rooms starting out here with this outdoor room. And that's what I consider a porch, an outdoor room. Hey, 
look here, windows. While I was away, they delivered all of the windows. We've been waiting for them for some time now. They brought them in a big truck and all 14 of them were unloaded in here in the house and Tony's already started finding homes for them. This is the part of the show that I really enjoy because you send me photographs of your landscapes with some ideas that we might throw around to improve them. So why don't we take a look at a garden in Kansas. This house belongs to Cindy. Now she tells me that her house faces southeast and that she very much likes ornamental grasses. And I see you're experimenting with some different, looks like miscanthus grass here and here and maybe some over here. Let me just give you a few ideas. There's really not much that needs to be removed here. But if you brought this bed around, you can see it comes around the back across here. What if it swept around this tree like that and you made this bed here even more generous, came around here across the front of this fence. It looks like you've got a gate here. You also mentioned that you like burning bush and if we use some of those as sort of a structural plant that was used maybe a big drift of those here and maybe another drift of them here, and then come back over here on this side and do another drift of burning bush there. So you set into place the structural elements. And I love burning bush because of that really intense red color they get in the fall. And then what I would do, Cindy, is perhaps uh, place a large boulder here, just a big natural boulder here. And you might even integrate one of them over here on this side like this. And you also mentioned that you liked liriope. So what if under this tree, this was all planted in liriope all around like this and this, where there's a pocket here of color where you could plant some beautiful annuals. Say so we have a pocket right here for some color and then we do a pocket of color right here. So there's a great place for maybe some of those outrageous super tunias that would spill out onto the, your stone wall. All right, now let's get to the grasses. What I'd love to see you do is mix some grasses with some other things that feel like the prairie. For instance, Russian sage is a great companion plant, one of my favorites, along with maybe purple coneflower, and then add some daylilies. And just with those four different kinds of plants, you get distinctly different flower forms, but I want you to plant these, these grasses in big drifts, okay? So there might be a big drift of Russian sage, maybe five to seven plants of Russian sage, and then another drift of, let's say, one of the switch grasses, like um, Panicum uh, Cheyenne Skies is a very good one, would be great for you. Maybe seven to 10 of those in big groups. You want them to grow in big clumps like this, and then next to it you might place that purple cone flower in groups of five to seven and do the same thing over here on this side and sort of repeat and balance. But think about those plants, the daylily, the Russian sage, and the purple cone flower, and then a variety of grasses, about three different grasses where they're tall to low and don't have just single plants like you have here, here, and here. If you group them together, in, in masses, it's gonna make a really bold impact. And start tall and come down smaller or lower as you come toward the walkway into the front of the house. I think it could be really spectacular. Now, Cindy, I hope this is helpful. Good luck to you. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've come away with some ideas on how you can enhance any room in your house. You know, you don't have to go through and change a lot. Just adding a few things, sort of sprucing up a little bit here and there can make a big difference. Until next time for The Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.